Uh, thank you very much, everybody, and, and I'm really grateful that you've all managed to come despite it being so hot. Uh, I'm originally from Australia, and when it's as hot as this, we normally go and jump in, in the sea. And I know there's a lovely fountain right there, and the fact that you're all here and you're not in the fountain, uh, I, I, I really appreciate it. And, you know, I don't know how you do it. I just about jumped in myself a moment ago. Another thing is that being from Australia, um, sadly, I don't speak uh, German, and I apologise, all of this is in English. In Australia, we only have two choices for others. We can either talk to New Zealanders or we can talk to the sheep. And nobody will talk to the New Zealanders, so uh, we will, we will really. Are there any New Zealanders here? No, uh, no good, right. <laughs> anyway, um, so if anyone um, can't see this, I'm sorry it's so bright, we have to keep the uh, windscreens open to let the air in, uh, but if you can't see it, please consider coming down the front if there's any more spots. There are a few spots around. Um, I went to veterinary school in Australia um, and after that I went to the United Kingdom and practiced small animal uh, veterinary medicine, so cats and dogs and small animals for around about eight years before I went into academia. And I had a special interest in plant-based diets for cats and dogs and I want to share with you today a lot of what I learnt. After doing that for about eight years, I was uh, recruited uh, to go here. Uh, I don't know if anyone can actually see my slides, I hope so. Uh, this is the University of Winchester. Uh, this is one hour south of London, uh, where I was uh, able to set up a Centre for Animal Welfare. Um, and we have a distance learning master's course in animal welfare. And I know that some people want to become professional animal advocates, so I thought I would mention this. If anyone is interested, um, I run this program. There's some leaflets about it out the front. Um, now, we're here to talk about plant-based diets for cats and dogs. And we hear most of all, I think, that cats in particular uh, cannot be healthy uh, on a plant-based diet. So I'd like to start my presentation with the story of the most famous vegetarian cat. And she was a member of the Felid family, so she's kind of a cat. She's actually a lioness. She was an African lioness. Uh, called Little Tyke, who was uh, raised on an animal sanctuary in, the, in California in the 1950s by a lovely couple called Georges and Margaret Wespo. And she was raised from uh, lioness hood, uh, little kitten hood, uh, as with a lamb, a deer and a swan. And all of these animals became her firm friends. And she was not raised with other lions roaming around the African plains, leaping on you know, impalas, news, uh, giraffes, gazelles, and she was not raised to use her powerful musculature and her skeletal system to rip and grind prey animals and to catch them. Uh, instead, she was raised with these animals that were all her friends, and she didn't uh, have any understanding that she was supposed to be hunting and, and eating other animals. Um, and so to the, she would resist all efforts to get her to eat any meat. Uh, the Westbos fed her on a double handful of uh, cooked grains chosen for their protein, calcium, fats and roughage content, half a gallon of milk and two eggs per day. To safeguard the health of her teeth, uh, they would give her a rubber gumboot with her favourite perfume sprinkled on it and she would chew away at uh, this gumboot and one gumboot would last her for about a month. Nevertheless, they were made very worried by the claims of their veterinarians that because she was an obligate carnivore, she really needed to eat meat. And so they posted a $1,000 reward to anyone else who could successfully get her to eat some meat. And back in the 1950s, $1,000 was quite a lot of money. So many people tried to claim this money, but nobody ever succeeded. By the age of uh, four, uh, she was 10 feet 4 inches long. She could run at uh, 64 kilometres an hour, about 40 miles an hour. She was 350 kilograms in weight, about 180 pounds. Um, sorry, 180 uh, kilograms, 350 pounds. And uh, one of America's most experienced zoo curators said she was the healthiest African lioness he had ever seen. And so at that point, they stopped worrying about uh, trying to get her to eat some meat. If you search the literature, there's at least one other report uh, of an African uh, lion, lion who was a vegetarian as well. Uh, this one accompanied uh, an Indian guru in his wanderings around India about 100 years ago. And there are some some uh, one or two very old sort of early age photographs of this, this uh, line with this guru. So they do exist. 
Now, clearly, uh, little Tyke was not uh, a vegan. She was uh, an over-lacto-vegetarian, so she ate, as I said, eggs, milk, and uh, vegetable products. And, of course, vegan means just the healthy uh, vegetables and fruit only, doesn't it? And, of course, no, it doesn't anymore because uh, these days, of course, you can get all sorts of wonderful other things that are vegan too. Now, we know that people around the world are increasingly choosing vegan diets, plant-based diets for these sorts of issues. We kill around about 70 billion land-based animals per year in the world, and about 90% of those are intensively farmed. So uh, they're raised in very confined environments where they're unable to exercise a, a wide range of highly motivated natural behaviours. They have all sorts of painful husbandry procedures inflicted on them, such as castration, tail docking, glee clawing, usually without painkillers, unfortunately. We know about the food justice concerns. Um, the average uh, North American consumes about 800 kilograms of grain per person per year, whereas the average Indian person consumes about 200 kilograms per person per year because the uh, North Americans uh, consume most of their grain in the form of cows, sheep, uh, milk, and, and so on because the grain fed to those uh, species is mostly lost and not converted to useful uh, protein. The feed conversion ratios are uh, the, the weakest in the case of beef cattle where we lose about 90% of what is fed to them down to about 50% in the case of pigs um, and, and even lower in the case of other species. But nevertheless, it's never um, a perfect conversion. We always lose a lot. Now about 3 billion consumers in the developing world are trying to adopt the affluent uh, lifestyles of those of us in Western countries that are seen as highly desirable. They're greatly increasing their consumption of animal products. This is driving up the price of grain around the world. Back in the 1990s, there were 825 pe million people worldwide suffering from hunger and malnutrition. With 20 years of progress, the number has not gone down, it's gone up. Uh, we've now got more than a billion people around the world suffering from hunger and malnutrition driven by this increase in consumption of animal products particularly. So there's a real food justice concern. Environment, you know, we know that 16% of anthropogenic, that is man-made greenhouse gases come from animals, uh, come from uh, the livestock sector in particular. And unlike fossil fuel uh, burning, which is necessary to sustain our cities and our industries, and unlike the transportation system, most of which is not for leisure, but actually to get people to and from work, the consumption of animal products is entirely discretionary, something that we can choose to change immediately. Um, so it's, it's really important that uh, it, it makes a major contribution. It's the only, only area, I think, where there's the capacity to make immediate changes without major technological uh, innovations. And of course, we know about the health concerns. The main causes of death in, in people in, in westernised countries today are cardiovascular disease, heart disease and stroke in particular, uh, and cancer. And then the diseases associated with overnutrition, uh, diabetes, um, obesity, and so on. People are increasingly concerned about uh, these issues for their companion animals as well and starting to become interested in, in switching their cats and dogs on the plant-based diets to also address all of these sorts of concerns. So what I want to do is initially look at some of the, uh, the, the normal meat-based diets that we feed our cats and dogs, the commercial meat-based diets, and look at uh, some of the health hazards that are associated with those. Uh, look at the basic um, biological requirements that animals have, uh, which determines what we should feed them. Uh, look at the issue of natural behaviour. Many people are concerned that plant-based diets are not natural and the commercial meat-based diets are, so I'd like to look at that. Ask whether there are any health benefits on plant-based diets, cats and dogs, and then give a, a little bit of advice about transitioning onto diets uh, safely and healthily and easily for your cats and dogs. Now, we know that there are health hazards associated with commercial meat-based diets for cats and dogs. Occasionally, there are major dis disasters that happen. And uh, probably the biggest one in history was in 2007 when uh, wheat flour imported from China um, was found to have been contaminated with melamine uh, in order to artificially increase the protein content. But melamine is not uh, an animal feed. It's an ingredient of plastics, it's a flame retardant, and it's and used in fertilizers. And unfortunately, it causes kidney failure and death. So in North America, where the data comes from, uh, there were around 200... Uh, brands that were recalled. The Food and Drug Administration received about 10,000 complaints by the end of 2007 and it's thought that thousands of cats and dogs unfortunately died uh, from this contamination uh, that was in so many of the commercial brands. 
Now, things like that are very dramatic. Uh, they're also uh, more uncommon. Things that are, are common are these sorts of hazards that are found in the commercial meat-based diets. Um, meat, meal, and byproducts. So these are the parts of animals that are slaughtered that are not considered to be edible uh, for humans. So they might be things like uh, the tendons, the ligaments, the hooves, the ears, the snouts, the poor quality components. Uh, in order to get a bit more money from uh, the animals, um, these will be diverted into the animal food chain, the pet food chain. 4D animals are ones that arrive at the slaughterhouse that are uh, diseased, disabled, dying or dead on arrival, so 4Ds. Uh, they're not allowed to be fed to, an to humans either, and, but they, are, they can be fed to animals. Uh, supermarket rejects, so the meat in the supermarket aisles, uh, when it reaches its use-by date and it passes its use-by date, it can't be sold uh, for human consumption, but it can be sold into the animal food chain. And there have been reports that sometimes uh, to save labour costs and time, the plastic packaging is not always removed, things like that. Uh, premium brands, the high, higher quality uh, meat brace brands are less likely to have these low quality ingredients in them. But then there's more of an animal welfare concern because there's a greater proportion of the diets coming from animals that have gone through the intensive livestock system and been killed just for, uh, just for cats and dogs. So there's a bit more of an ethical problem there. Now our cats and dogs are, are quite often very smart, as I'm sure many of you will know, uh, and they would not voluntarily choose to eat. Uh, some of these uh, things that we put in these cans and these packages and try to feed to them. So we trick them. Uh, the most powerful uh, additive that, that is added by the pet food industry uh, to commercial um, meat-based pet food is digest. Digest was discovered, I think, in the 1970s, and it's a, it's a partially dissolved mixture of chicken, mostly intestines, but sometimes other abdominal organs and chest organs as well with particular enzymes and substrates added into them to change the flavour of each batch. And if you buy a can of um, beef stew to feed to your dog or a can of uh, ocean whitefish, it may be to do more with the uh, particular types of enzymes and substrates that have been added in, changing the flavour, rather than the miscellaneous bo animal body parts that are in, in the actual tin. So that's very effective, actually. Uh, cats in particular have been maintained on a particular flavour of digest for a long time, can become very resistant to changing uh, to other foods. Um, I want to say something about fish. Uh, we like to feed uh, fish to our cats. Fish have a particular problem that land animals don't have. They've got two issues. One is that the oceans are increasingly contaminated with heavy metals such as mercury, which are known to be cause birth defects. Uh, in people, uh, and also organic pollutants such as PCBs and other organic pollutants. Now, a lot of these are actually lipophilic. They're attracted to fat. So little fish swim around the sea and get exposed to some of this, and it concentrates in their fatty tissues. They have not spent thousands of years evolving with these toxins in their environments, and they have not evolved the mechanisms to get them out of their bodies. So you get a concentration around the fats. Now, bigger fish eat the little fish, and so on. And by the time you get to the top of the food chain, the biggest fish, you've got quite a concentration of these toxins building up in the body. So that's one concern. The second concern is that the, um, once, once the animals are pulled out of the water and they die, um, their skin uh, is no longer being protected by uh, the mucus layer that's always being produced in living fish. And they, they dry out, the skin starts to crack, there is no immune system that's left. It's very rapidly colonised by bacteria. Now, there have been surveys showing that of, uh, one of the surveys looked at, uh, that I looked at was for human-grade fish. About 40% uh, of the human-grade fish had bacterial counts of more than 500,000 bacteria per gram, which was the definition of spoiled. And another 30% of the human-grade fish had bacterial counts of more than 10 million per gram, which was the definition of rotten. And now, of course, this is the human-grade fish. The fish going off into the animal food chain is the fish of lower quality than this. Now, we try to uh, minimise this problem by putting the fish straight into great big chilling tanks on the ships. The trouble is that can't can completely stop this process. It just slows it down. And the transportation chains for fish are much longer than for land animals. They're not walking into a slaughterhouse alive, being killed and packaged and straight out to the re retailer. Instead, 
uh, they have to spend days or even weeks at sea before they eventually get to the port. So the time is longer, so there's more chance of bacterial colonisation to occur. So there's a couple of problems with fish. Infectious diseases, we're concerned about uh, all sorts of pathogenic bacteria, Salmonella, uh, Listeria, Yersinia and Campylobacter and others. This is particularly a concern in raw meat diets which are now quite popular to feed to cats and dogs. There's a whole host of studies done enough to fill a book. I know because I've read the book, one of my colleagues wrote the book. It's full of these studies uh, showing that the rates of uh, colonisation with pathogenic bacteria is much higher in cats and dogs, particularly on the raw meat diets. And it doesn't stop there. The, the human beings in the same households are also getting colonised by these bacteria. We have other toxins in the commercial meat-based diets too. We have endotoxins which are uh, released by some of these bacteria when they're cooked and their, their uh, walls break down and they release these toxins into the meat. Mycotoxins are fungal toxins. So when we produce things like dry kibble in packages and they go into warehouses for several weeks, sometimes they get contaminated by fungus. Fungus starts to grow upon them. Now, one of the most dangerous is aflatoxicosis. Aflatoxin is produced by Aspergillus flavus, uh, one of the uh, fungi, and it causes liver failure in dogs. Uh, so that's basically circling, jaundice, vomiting, lack of balance, collapse, and unfortunately death. Um, there have been a couple of outbreaks that have killed uh, tens of these uh, dogs in the United States and causing recalls of some of these diets to occur. So that's a hazard when these products are produced and they're warehoused for longer periods of time, which sometimes they are. And finally, there's processing. Processing involves uh, heat, uh, chemical treatments, pressures, and um, this is probably not going to do anything to the minerals, say the calcium and the phosphorus, but it's, it definitely degrades the fragile vitamins and it can denature and unravel the amino acids, the proteins, and destroy those. Has anyone heard that um, cats need taurine? How many people have heard cats need taurine? And that taurine is in meat, right? You all heard, yep, some of you have heard that. Without taurine, you know, cats will eventually go blind, they'll have birth defects, they'll have um, heart problems in a developing kitten. Well, the processing of the meat-based diets destroys the taurine. It's an amino acid. So after processing, there's, no, uh, there's not enough active taurine left in the meat-based diets. They figured this out in, a, I think, about the 1970s when there were significant numbers of cats having these problems and they worked out what the problem was. So they decided to add taurine in after the processing from a synthetic source. So synthetic taurine gets added back into the meat-based diet so it doesn't cause harm to cats. Uh, of course, you can add the same synthetic taurine into the plant-based diets as well. So what are some of the adverse health effects that have been documented from cats and dogs being maintained on these commercial meat-based diets? They're things like kidney disease, liver disease, heart disease, neurologic diseases, visual disorders, musculoskeletal, skin bleeding, birth defects, compromisation of the immune system and infectious diseases. Now, I found all this evidence in a whole bunch of scientific papers, um, and they include things like Cornell Veterinarian, um, Journal of the American Medical Association. These, this is one of the top journals in the veterinary field toxicological sciences, animal nutrition, and so on. I found all these by accident without trying. When I was trying to find the studies showing me that plant-based diets would, would cause problems for cats and dogs, I did succeed in finding one study showing that a plant-based diet which was formulated to be deficient in potassium caused a problem in cats. The problem was that the cats showed signs of potassium deficiency but I didn't find any other studies. There were no other studies. I accidentally found 10 studies and now another one, 11 studies, showing all these sorts of problems uh, uh, in animals maintained on meat-based diets. Um, maybe if I actually tried to look, I would find more. So if we are worried about meat-based diets, what should we be feeding our cats and dogs if we're concerned about all, all the sorts of hazards that are so common? It's, it's worthwhile going back to basics and trying to remember what the cats and dogs and any species really need. They need these three things. Firstly, they need the diet to be adequately palatable. It needs to taste okay, look okay, smell okay, have the right texture so that the animals will be motivated to eat the food. And 
uh, there are many uh, very happy uh, cats and dogs being currently maintained on a plant-based diet, so this is certainly achievable. I'm going to skip to number three, bioavailability. We need to supply the nutrients they need in a formulation which is adequately digestible and absorbable into the body. All the different ingredients have got different bioavailabilities, but the, the data I've seen indicates the plant-based ones aren't very significantly different from the meat-based ones. Actually, nothing's 100%. They're often all about 70 to 80%. So going back to number two, nu nutritional soundness, that's the big one. Uh, particularly with plant-based cats, people are worried that they won't get all the nutrients they need. And we often forget that nutrients and ingredients are not the same thing. Uh, what animals need is uh, all the nutrients uh, that that species needs for that life stage, uh, neonatal, developing young, uh, pregnant, lactating, very old, different life stages and the species. They all have different nutrient profiles. And so long as we supply all the nutrients that the animals need, there's no scientific reason why you can't do it in a plant-based uh, synthetic mineral diet without animal products. The important thing is that there are all the nutrients that the animals need and it's adequately palatable and bioavailable. I see many of you waving your, your handouts. Um, I'm so sorry it's so hot in here. And for those who don't have handouts, I do encourage you to take my handouts. There's, there's some at the, the front there. I have a nice summary of this entire talk. So. Uh, um, I, I know that people don't necessarily remember anything that speakers say, so I try to give a summary. I'm sorry it's in English, but you can use it as a fan if you don't have one. Um, now, what about the nutritional adequacy of the plant-based diets for cats and dogs? Because there are quite a number of these on the market now. There have been some concerns raised about the nutritional soundness of these diets. Um, the first big one, I think, was, well, the first prominent one was in 2004. Uh, when two diets were examined, uh, veggie cat kibble mix, which is a homemade diet that people prepare according to a recipe and add a supplement in to make sure all the nutrients are there that the cats need. And then there was a, a complete diet, uh, which you just buy a complete diet for adult cats, and that was produced by Evolution. Now, in this study, they were sent off to independent laboratories, and they were both found to be deficient in certain amino acids and some other uh, vitamins. One of them was also deficient in overall protein content. Um, I talked to the companies and we tried to work out what had happened and they established that it had been formulation errors at the factory. They'd mixed up mixing bottles. Some nutrients were too high, others were too low. Um, I'm going to start skipping a few things, but the quote there is from Harbingers of a New Age. I'm just doing that for time. Um, and they said that they were shocked at this result. They would put steps in place to make sure it didn't happen again and they'd submit their diet to uh, independent laboratory analysis in the future. So that was good. The other company, Evolution, said, look, we've got 10 to 20,000 healthy and long-living dogs, cats, and ferrets on our diets, and uh, major animal sanctuaries use them, and we haven't seen any problems. So that was kind of reassuring as well. Nevertheless, not ideal. Another one of these studies came up in 2015. This one looked at uh, 24 canned diets, vegetarian diets. Some were vegan, some weren't, uh, for cats and dogs in the US. And the essential point here is that all of them were, were fine in terms of their overall protein, but one in four were not fine in terms of all the amino acids, the building blocks of proteins like taurine and, and other amino acids. One in four were deficient, so that wasn't good. The study authors said that the samples were only collected at one point in time from one batch of product. Substantial variations in results could have been because of uh, laboratory methods used to analyze the, the pro product. And they said that it would have been even better to look at the blood concentrations of nutrients rather than the nutrients in, in the tins. So they, they cautioned about reading too much into these results. Nevertheless, this is still concerning. There have been some other studies like this as well, sometimes showing some deficiencies in the plant-based diets. So what should we do if we're concerned about the meat-based diets, but we're, we're a little bit cautious about the plant-based diets? What should we do? One is don't panic. The internet and books are full of stories of very healthy plant-based cats and dogs that have been plant-based for a very long term. Secondly, don't forget we're not comparing against perfection. We're comparing against the other options that exist in the real world. And the other options are the meat-based diets. How good are the meat-based diets? Well, they're not necessarily great either. Um, this is a study that a colleague and myself published. We basically reviewed all of the existing evidence in the field uh, recently. And this paper is now sort of the reference article 
uh, for this field, and it's been uh, viewed more than 33,000 times in, in three years. But part of this paper looks at uh, this other study uh, in 2009 that looked at uh, five US states where there was available data from 2,200 pet foods. They were nearly all meat-based pet foods, and they found that variations between labeling claims and the true nutritional content uh, was common, mostly low, but quite often comprised a significant proportion of the nutrient, up to 30% of the nutrient, which is actually biologically quite significant. And they also said that the uh, metabolizable energy density, so the energy density of the food, was often wrong. It was often actually much higher than was being reported on the tins. This is important because the majority of cats and dogs are now becoming overweight. And if we're feeding them diets which are uh, higher in energy than we think they are, this is contributing to them becoming overweight. And that's actually quite a major health problem for cats and dogs today. They get all sorts of problems uh, because of this. Um, and they said that within every type of food they looked at, there were some examples where the nutritional values weren't just 30%, they were a long way off what they should have been, actually. So in other words, um, there are concerns about the adequacy of plant-based companion animal diets, but the same concerns also apply to a wide range of, of meat-based diets as well, actually. And they said that it's highly plausible that independent laboratory analyses of a wide range of commercial diets plant-based or meat-based would probably all reveal these sorts of problems, these deviations in nutritional values compared to what they ideally should be. They said this doesn't negate the principle that we should be able to formulate plant-based diets or meat-based diets actually to meet all the nutritional requirements. doesn't negate that at all. It just demonstrates a problem with the quality control process, the manufacturing process of these diets. So what should we do? Well. This most recent study said that all three of the veterinary prescription diets in the study met all of the nutritional requirements and all of the labelling requirements. So they tend to be manufactured to a higher standard. They have nutritionists on staff. That's one thing we can do, try to go for the higher quality diets, the veterinary diets. Secondly, regardless, can regularly monitor your animal. You know, weigh your animal monthly, look for subtle changes in body weight, look for changes in coat condition, vomiting, anything odd going on. Consider having a screening blood test once a year, maybe every six months if your animal's very old. Monitor your animal. Now, there are also reported quite a wide range of health benefits of people maintaining their animals on plant-based diets. And the sort of benefits that are reported uh, on cases on the internet and in popular books about the subject are these sorts of things. Decreased external parasites, improved coat condition, allergy reduction. Animals very often respond to environmental allergens not by getting hay fever like we do, but by getting skin reactions. They get inflamed skin, very itchy skin, quite uncomfortable. So there's an improvement in that uh, very often. Improved body weight control, just like humans that transition, they often slim down a bit. Uh, they may have reduction or regression in diabetes. Uh, cataracts in the eyes, increased overall health and vitality. Uh, reportedly decreased incidences of cancer, which makes sense given that a lot of them are associated with too much body fat actually, and some other improvements as well. That's all great, but these are just popular reports, aren't they? How good is that evidence? It's not that great. What we really need is controlled studies of populations of cats and dogs maintained on plant-based diets and published in the scientific literature. Well, good news, we now have some of those. Um, so this is the first large-scale study of a population of plant-based cats uh, compared to meat-based cats. This was published by uh, a colleague of mine in 2006 in one of the world's uh, top veterinary journals. And the important points are that there were 34 cats maintained on a vegetarian diet. Most of them were actually vegan, except for about three, I think, for at least one year, so long enough term. 52 cats maintained on a meat-based diet for at least one year. There were no significant differences in their age, their body conditioning, their housing, or Papith's health status. Most cats were described by their owners as being uh, uh, healthy or generally healthy. They looked at the blood nutrient values of two of the nutrients, taurine and cobalamin, which is a B vitamin. Taurine was fine in all the plant-based cats. Uh, the B vitamin was fine in all except for three of them. These three cats were fed partly on table scraps. Table scraps are not designed for cats. They're not nutritionally complete. 
So it's okay to feed a small amount of treats to your animals that aren't nutritionally complete, but they should be a minority. Majority, clear majority should be nutritionally complete. That's only cats. What about dogs? Well, it's hard to think of any dogs with greater nutritional demands than sprint racing Siberian huskies who have to pull sleds through heavy snow for durations of up to a month in long distance races in Alaska. So they decided, why don't we study some sprint racing Siberian Huskies? Fair enough. So they, they took uh, 12 of them, they split them into two groups that were either fed a commercial meat-based diet for active dogs or a meat-free diet to, uh, to the same specifications. In this case, I think it wasn't 100% plant-based, but it was certainly meat-free. It was their only nutrient intake for four months, which included 10 weeks of competitive racing. That's a long time, actually. They took blood samples in the beginning, regularly throughout. There were uh, veterinary checks throughout and at the end. The blood results for all dogs were excellent. There was a change. They all had increased red blood cell counts, which is something you see with athletes and athlete dogs as well. Uh, they're all in excellent physical condition. No changes between the groups. So we've got a dog study as well. Okay. What about the issue of natural behaviour? Many people are concerned that, you know, feeding cats in particular on plant-based diets would be unnatural. Well, as uh, the author of Obligate Carnivore, Jed Gillen, says, he says, try this experiment. Skip your cat's breakfast one morning. Take him or her down to the beach. Observe your cat. See what natural instincts will kick in. See if they will swim 50 miles or so out into the deep ocean to engage an adult tuna fish in an underwater battle to the death remembering that a tuna is about as big as a horse to satisfy the natural feline desire for fish. So clearly we feed our cats um, body parts from fish, from cows, from uh, sheep, all sorts of animals they would never naturally eat, laced with all sorts of toxins, uh, antibiotics, uh, unhealthy residues of various uh, products at predictable times daily. Now the natural feeding behaviour of a cat is to eat a variety of large insects, uh, small birds, small rodents at unpredictable times. When they do make a kill, they would gorge as much as possible to prevent consumption by a, a competitor. And this would be followed by an uncertain period of starvation. That's the natural feeding behaviour of a cat. The uh, dietary regimes that we inflict upon our companion animals today uh, bear no relationship really to natural feeding behaviour and actually they're, they're potentially hazardous for our cats and dogs. Now just a few words as, as I approach the end. Uh, for those who are interested in uh, transitioning their cats and dogs onto plant-based diets, um, it's important to do a couple of things. Firstly, I should say easing the transition. Um, it's, it's best not to switch your animal one day to the next completely onto a different diet. It's best to do a gradual change over perhaps a couple of weeks um, to allow things like the digestive enzymes and the intestinal bacteria to gradually transition. You're less likely to have any adverse reactions such as diarrhoea. So the way to do this is to add in a little bit of a new diet, mix it up as thoroughly as possible with the old diet, uh, and don't act by your behaviour that anything strange is happening. Don't be alarmed if your very intelligent cat or dog can see straight through you and carefully picks around the new food and ignores it. Because simply having it in close association with what it knows is food over time will help make the necessary mental connection. Always try feeding uh, fresh food, tasty food, smelly food, sense of smell is important to cats and dogs. You can try uh, dietary additives such as vegetable oil, spirulina, nori flakes, nutritional yeast to make it more tasty. Gradual patience and persistence are the most important factors. Very old cats who've been on a particular flavour of digest most of their lives may be very stubborn and it can take up to six months to get 90% of the way there. But the most stubborn of cats have been transitioned so don't give up. Now, regarding safeguarding health, there are two things I want to mention. One is it's important to make sure your animal does get all the nutrients it needs. Um, so you can either buy a commercial diet which is labelled as being nutritionally complete or you can make a homemade diet according to a recipe and add in a nutritional supplement that you can buy to make sure it's getting all the nutrients it needs. Now as we know there are concerns about nutritional soundness of some of these diets. Try to go for the high, higher quality ones, look at the claims that are made about nutritional soundness, consider switching every 6 or 12 months to a different uh, diet just in case they both have deficiencies in some micronutrient, at least it will be a different one. You could try that too. Don't fool yourself thinking the meat-based diets are any better in terms of safety or nutritional adequacy. 
Secondly, the uh, urine can actually change a little bit, become a little bit more alkaline on a plant-based diet. And this can be a problem because there are mineral crystals in the urine that can come together and form tiny stones and bigger stones and eventually block up the urinary tract. That obviously is extremely important. That's very dangerous. Now, it's mostly a problem in male cats because they have the smallest urinary tract. But I recommend everyone actually gets a little urine sample. Shove a foil baking tray from the supermarket underneath a dog when it goes to urinate or get some non-absorbent little plastic beads from your vet uh, put it in the cat litter tray and try to collect a cat urine sample from your cat. I'd say do this once a month. Put a little paper test strip in it from a pet store or your veterinarian or get an electric pH meter to test the acidity. Uh, I've got a website. It'll tell you what the normal acidity is. Normally they're, they're slightly acidic. It'll tell you what to do, to what to add into the diet if it's starting to change and become a bit more alkaline. If you're just getting in the habit of doing this once a month, kind of like checking the oil in a car, I suppose, for anyone that still does that, um, then I, I do recommend people take this seriously. It only affects a small proportion of animals, but I recommend everyone checks all their animals at least once a month, and maybe once a week if there are changes going on or if there's any concern. For people that want to know more about uh, how to transition their animals, what to add into the diets, this is my website, veggiepets.info, V-E-G-E-Pets.info. It's got uh, long articles, reference articles. It's got short summaries. It's got a link to YouTube videos. Um, I was asked to answer a series of questions in like two minutes long on a whole series of topics. So, so they're there. The opinions of other vets that uh, work in this space as well. And the final thing I want to say about this really is we choose these plant-based diets for ourselves for ethical, environmental and health reasons. The same benefits, of course, apply to companion animal diets too. Uh, I think they provide the best choices for both our companion animals, if they're nutritionally sound, and of course so-called food animals that we often don't think about. In the closing minute, I just want to say that I'd, I'd like to take the opportunity just to tell everyone we've just launched a brand new diet on plant-based nutrition, sorry, a brand new course on the internet, distance learning at the University of Winchester, where I'm at, six weeks long, uh, the first distance learning course on plant-based nutrition in the United Kingdom. Six weeks, 350 pounds. It's a collaboration of all these doctors, but it's particularly run by my colleague, Professor Shireen Kassam, who's a haematologist, and she's the leader of the um, UK Health Professionals for Plant-Based Nutrition. Now, she tells me it's been very popular, and she's almost filled up for this semester, so if you are interested, please check it out soon. Uh, if Otherwise, it'll run again next semester in January and every semester thereafter. Right, thanks very much. I'm going to give away to my next speaker who will need to set up now and I'm going to go around the corner and take any questions just outside there afterwards. But thanks so much for coming and persisting through the heat. Well done, thank you.